Hello and welcome to the Media Reporter. I'm Brian Dolan. On today's episode, we'll be talking about a very current and controversial topic, end-of-life issues. What exactly are your rights at the end of your life? What are the rights for your family? Can you ask a doctor to assist you at the end of your life? These questions and more are going to be answered by today's special guest, Peter Strauss, a professor at New York Law School. Peter, welcome to today's show. Thank you, Brian, for having me. Now, Peter, when we say death with dignity or, or end-of-life issues, uh, what exactly are we talking about? We're talking about a history uh, that uh, has led the courts to finally accept the reality that individuals have a right to choose what kind of care and treatment they wish to have at the end of their lives. It really boils down to uh, a question of who decides. We're all going to die. Uh, death is inevitable. But we're pushing back the mortality tables. Uh, there are now 100,000 Americans over the age of 100. When was the last time you heard Willard Scott wish happy birthday to anybody <laughs> under 100? Yeah. <laughs> Probably 40 years ago. And the fastest growing segment of the population is the over 85 cohort. And that's the good news. The bad news is, and people don't like to hear this, that above 85, 50% of us will be playing golf and 50% of us will be unable to function. That means we won't be able to perform the activities of daily living we won't be able to feed ourselves, bathe ourselves, dress ourselves. Mm -hmm. The cause, strokes, Parkinson's disease, dementia, 70% of all dementia is caused by the disease known as Alzheimer's disease. So we lose our capacity to decide. Now the courts have developed the rights of people to refuse treatment. Nobody can touch you without your informed consent. A doctor can't perform surgery upon your body except in an emergency when you're not able to communicate, unless you consent to it. The question, however, at the end of life is, do we lose that ability to refuse the treatment we don't want when we no longer have capacity to express our wishes? And it sounds like it should be a simple answer, but it is not a simple answer. The struggle has been between whether the state makes those decisions for us by establishing rules that say, unless you express your wishes in a certain way while you had capacity, we're going to treat you. We will say the, provisors, the providers of health care, hospitals, physicians, nurses, et cetera, must treat. Or is it up to the individual's family, the individual's representatives, the persons that he has lived with and who know his wishes or her wishes best? And it's been a long process. And most of the decisions have pushed the balance of the scale towards the, the client and the family, the patient and the family, but there are some situations where that hasn't yet occurred. Ironically, New York has been probably the most conservative state in this area. Well, tell us a little bit more about uh, how New York treats this end-of-life issue. Well, <clears throat> New York, because of the peculiar political makeup of our society here with uh, very strong religious values expressed by organizations who have a lot of power in our state legislature. Um, in most states, the family is allowed to make end-of-life decisions for the patient based on what's called the doctrine of substituted judgment, meaning that they can interpret what the patient's wishes would be under those particular set of facts. The family can speak for the patient, not saying what they think is good for the patient, but expressing what they firmly and honestly believe the patient would have decided if the patient could speak. New York, until very recently, has never accepted that philosophy. New York courts have established many years ago the doctrine of clear and convincing evidence. New York courts said, unless you know what the patient's wishes would be under these circumstances, by a very high level of evidence, the clear and convincing evidence standard, the physician must treat. And sometimes there's a, a conflict between what the family thinks the patient would have decided and their failure to meet this high evidentiary standard. Now, it was even harsher for persons with mental retardation or developmental disabilities. 
because there the courts had ruled that since the patient was retarded from birth and never had significant cognitive ability to express a wish, you always had to treat. There could be no withholding or withdrawal of treatment. Now the first crack in that very harsh approach came about 10 years ago when there was an amendment to the law that allowed the parents or guardians of persons with mental retardation or developmental disabilities to make end-of-life decisions. Very strict rules, very high standards, but yet even if they couldn't meet that very high standard of clear and convincing evidence, we made a breakthrough. Then, last June, June 1st, a new law went into effect in New York called the uh, Family Health Care Decisions Act. This law was introduced 17 years ago. It's taken 17 years to pass this law, which in effect allows the family member on a priority list. It would be first priority would be the guardian. The next person would be the spouse or the domestic partner. Here we've really brought uh, the non-traditional relationship persons into the law and they have top priority. So gay and lesbian partners now have the right to be the surrogate decision maker after the spouse or domestic partner, it would be a child, or then a parent, or then siblings. And those persons, called surrogates, may make medical decisions for persons who can't speak for themselves, and can may also, they're also allowed to make <clears throat> end of life decisions, so that uh, if we don't meet the clear and convincing evidence standard, decisions can be made. So we've shifted it from the state being the decider by saying, if you don't meet certain standards, you must be treated to the family. And this is a wonderful, positive development. Peter, could you talk to us a little bit? Uh, you, you've spoken to uh, what kind of rights the individual retains uh, in terms of the kind of treatment they will or will not be subject to at the end of their life. But what about the right to die itself? Where have the courts gone with this? Where are they going? Well, right to die is, is kind of a confusing term. Uh, <clears throat> we have a right to say no when we're competent. And we use the word capacitated now. We try not to use the word competent or incompetent. And as I said earlier, you don't lose that right if you lose capacity. That right can be uh, enforced on your behalf by your surrogate. And we also have in New York the health care proxy statute which was passed in 1992 and went into effect in 1993, you can designate someone to make health care decisions for you. And if there's one message I'd like the audience to walk away with is, is you should all have a health care proxy. If, you know, we're all going to live longer and we may be on the wrong side of that line as to who has capacity and who doesn't, choose the person that you want to make decisions for you and give them that authority by signing a health care proxy and then you have an agent who can decide for you on almost every issue. So that's really important. But what do we mean by end of life decisions? What do we mean by death with dignity? We really mean that the patient's choice prevails. Now, historically there are a lot of other factors that play here. If we allow people to make decisions at the end of life without uh, input from their physicians, are we undermining the medical profession? Are there state interests that come into play that have to be recognized? And those issues were always before the courts, but we now know, and the Supreme Court has said so in the Cruzan case and uh, in Vaco v. Quill and uh, Washington v. Glucksburg, that there is a right to refuse treatment. Mm -hmm. And this really means that we recognize an individual's choice about the quality of life. Now, People have all kinds of decisions uh, about, about uh, all kinds of wishes what they want to do. You know, I make a joke, which is in a sense a bad joke. You know, if I can no longer ski, I don't want any medical treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of an extreme uh, response to the question that you've raised. At, but at what point would I not want medical treatment? If I suffered from advanced dementia, and didn't interact cognitively with my family and my community. And I spiked pneumonia. Would I want the pneumonia treated? Mm -hmm. What would be the point? 
if I had advanced dementia and couldn't interact cognitively with my environment and my kidney started to fail, would I want dialysis? Probably not. But on the other hand, I would certainly want dialysis if there was the possibility that it could take the toxins out of my brain so that I could return to a situation where I could interact with you and have a co meaningful cognitive way of life. Doesn't mean I'm going to ski again, but that's my choice. But you may say, oh no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to live with this. Uh, you know, I, I, dialysis to me would be too invasive. Do you have that right? Absolutely. You could refuse that treatment. There's a famous case here in New York City. A woman was in Beth Israel Hospital. She, she had gangrene in her leg. Surgery was believed to be the only recourse. And they re recommended an amputation. She refused. Mm -hmm. It went to court. Her right to refuse was upheld because she had capacity to understand the consequences of her decision and understand what it meant to the possibility of her not living much longer. And she had her choice. She was allowed to have that choice. Would she have had that choice had she no longer been able to communicate her own wishes? Well, we'd have to look at that case individually. Under the old rules before June 1st, probably she would have been given that amputation without her choice, without her consent. Under the new rules, a surrogate family member could probably, under certain circumstances, refuse that on her behalf. We've come a long way. <clears throat> Peter, there's another choice I want to ask about. And do, does the law recognize a choice for people to, to choose to end their own life? And here I want to ask about the, the very controversial topic of assisted suicide. How has the law addressed that issue? In a very mixed way. Remember, suicide is no longer a crime in the United States. Um, we used to punish the victim by punishing the victim's family, mm -hmm. losing benefits, et cetera. That's no longer the case. Suicide is no longer a crime in any state in the United States. There may be moral and ethical and theological consequences to it, mm -hmm. which we're not going to go into today. <laughs> but you raise a different question. What about assisting someone in suicide? Now, historically, every state made it a crime to assist someone in committing suicide. There is a very strong movement um, led over the years by many organizations. Today, the leading advocacy organization uh, which supports physician aid in dying. It's no longer the appropriate term to say physician-assisted suicide. Of course, perhaps it's not really suicide anyway. Mm -hmm. It's assisting the natural processes of dying uh, to occur. Um, the state of Oregon, about 12 years ago, by referendum, passed a law legalizing physician aid in dying under very narrow circumstances. Um, it's limited to persons who are terminally ill, which is defined as death likely to occur within six months. You have to be uh, determined not to be driven by depression. Obviously, everybody who's terminally ill is going to be a little depressed. Mm -hmm. But if it's the depression that is driving the train here, you won't be allowed to be given the medication that you can self-administer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have this in Oregon. Relatively few people have availed themselves in the state of Oregon over the years that the law has been on the books. Many more have obtained the medication and not used it. It's like the last safety net for people who are terminally ill and may be suffering uh, pain and all kinds of suffering. Remember, suffering is much broader than, than pain. Uh, so the experience in Oregon has been quite unique and quite positive. It's turned out there's no slippery slope. Remember that the law only permits a, phys a qualified physician to give you the medication that you can self-administer. It is never in this country so far, at least in, in, in the approaches of the 
legitimate organizations been a question of allowing a physician to inject you and actually do the act that terminates the life. It is entirely up to the patient who has this medication, whether to self-administer or not. State of Washington now passed a referendum, it has physician aid in dying, and the Supreme Court of Montana in December of 2009 declared that under the Montana Constitution, which focuses very much on uh, privacy and choice and freedom and autonomy, under the Montana Constitution, physician aid in dying uh, is permitted. Now, nationally, it is not legal in any other state. Uh, the Supreme Court, in two very important cases I mentioned earlier, Vaco v. Quill, which came out of New York, and Washington v. Glucksburg, which came out of Washington, the Supreme Court said that the states do have the right to make it a criminal act to assist in suicide. Ironically, those Supreme Court decisions, which were unanimous, decisions written by Chief Justice Rehnquist, while they upheld the state's right to say physician aid in dying is not legal, the decisions did two other very important things. They encouraged further debate about this subject, and they also made it clear that the physician who administers high levels of medication to control pain, when done with the motivation to assist the patient in dealing with the suffering, cannot be convicted of a crime. It is not a crime, even though the medication may make death arrive sooner. It's very important that even in this conservative court written, uh, decision written by Chief Justice Rehnquist, the court made it very clear that when the motivation is to ease the suffering, it cannot be considered a crime. And what that's done is really enhanced and supported the palliative care movement and the hospice movement. So now a person at the end of life, certainly in Washington and Oregon and Montana at the moment, although there's pressure to reverse it by legislation in Montana, uh, has more than one choice, which is the, the self-administered medication to end your life. There's hospice, there's palliative care. We're moving forward in a very dramatic way to offer people more choices. And the other thing these Supreme Court decisions said that was really critically important is it made it clear that if a patient's tube feeding and hydration is stopped, the patient is dying not by starvation, but by the under, underlying medical treatment. So if you have uh, ALS disease, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, and it was your wish, even in New York, that at a certain point in time you no longer wish to be fed or hydrated, and that treatment was removed, that artificial nutrition and hydration is removed, the cause of death it's not starvation, it's ALS, it's Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm -hmm. And this came from Justice Rehnquist, who we would not normally categorize as a liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very important statement, because whenever you see someone at the end of life and there's an, a, a request to terminate treatment such as artificial nutrition and hydration, a you and cry is, you will be starving that person to death. And that's absolutely not true. In fact, you're remo removing an artificial impediment to the natural process of dying. And that really helps people understand the ethics of this. When we make decisions for others at the end of life, the top priority is what would mom have wanted? What are mom's wishes? We shouldn't be deciding what's good for mom at least not in the first instance. We want to look back at mom's life, mom's expressed wishes, mom's spoken choice, mom's writings. Hopefully there'll be a healthcare proxy and a living will. Mm -hmm. A living will is a healthcare declaration. In the healthcare proxy, you appoint someone to carry out your wishes. In the living will, you express your wishes in general terms about the kind of care and treatment you would want at the end of life. 
So the family member's obligation is not to decide, ah, she's had enough. Mm -hmm. It's what did she want? And that helps you make the right decision. Now, if you have no clue as what mom wanted, and mom has never done what I hope everyone will do, which is sign a health care proxy and sign a living will, mm -hmm. and you really do need both, then the law allows you to fall back on a different test. What is in mom's best interest? Now here again, that balance between autonomy and paternalism comes into play. If it's a best interest approach, what's best for mom now in these terrible end of life days? Should the state be saying, well, we come down on the side of life and all treatment must be furnished? Or do we say this is a family matter? The family knows mom best and knows what her wishes and values would be. And we've moved towards that. And I think that's a positive thing. Peter, you, you've spoken a little bit about uh, the challenges that exist at the political level in sort of selling politicians or maybe the public at large about um, the necessity and, and the good things behind uh, keeping end of life decisions with the family and with the individual. But of course, some of our viewers might be thinking about the, the headline grabbing cases, Terry Schiavo, Dr. Right. Kevorki, and things like that. How do you kind of overcome a lot of the sensational, you know, reporting about these issues that uh, causes politicians to act? You know, how do you, do you bring it back and you make the public focus in on what this issue is really about? Well, we need more education. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the Terry Schiavo case w was a horrible example of people with political motivation coming in and trying to intervene in what had been a, a fairly appropriate process. You know, the courts on many occasions had determined that the husband's expression of Terry Schiavo's wishes about her choice not to live this way was appropriate. There was evidence that this was really what Terry Schiavo would have wanted. Uh, but outsiders came in, whether it was political reasons or religious reasons. Uh, it's so ironic that people who are con truly conservative, who believe we ought to be free and independent, libertarians who say we ought to be able to make our own choices, when it comes to decisions like end of life, and perhaps abortion and others as well, want to intervene. When it deals with our sexuality and our personal privacy, they're no longer libertarians, they're interventionists. I've always found that extremely ironic. As far as Jack Kevorkian is concerned, and I am now a believer that, that physician assistance at the end of life ought to be permitted. It ought to be used narrowly and in relatively limited circumstances, but it, it ought to be one of the rights that we are able to enforce for ourselves. Kevorkian abused the process, in my judgment. Um, if you read the Oregon and Washington statutes, there are so many safeguards built in that Kevorkian didn't follow. He did not have relationships with his patients. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't know his patients. Uh, people would arrive at his doorstep and ask for assistance in dying. There was no serious analysis of whether that person, person was being motivated by overwhelming depression. There was no attempt to treat the depression. There was no attempt at counseling. There was no waiting period. All the things that are built in to the Oregon and Washington statutes, which allow this process to proceed only after checks on the process were, were followed. Uh, he got away with it in Michigan because Michigan did not have a statute that made physician aid in dying a crime. But he was acquitted many times by juries for that reason. Mm -hmm. But he finally did something which all of my colleagues agree stepped over the line. You know, he went on 60 Minutes and he was actually shown on television injecting the medication into a patient. Now that's euthanasia. The actor was not the patient who willingly, voluntarily, competently made that decision. Even though the patient requested it, so you might call it voluntary euthanasia, but the act was done 
by the physician, in this case, Dr. Jack Kevorkian, and not by the patient. And there is no reputable person in this country who believes we should be doing that. That's what is done in Holland. That's what is done in Switzerland. It, to me, it's very troubling. Uh, there's, no, there's no you and cry for that in this country. We are not seeking to terminate the lives of the mentally ill or the disabled. That's criminal. That is not physician aid in dying. That is euthanasia. And I think it would be a very sad day if this nation never permitted that, and it will not. Peter, thank you very much for coming on the show today. This has thank been a for talk. I think me. we could talk two or we three more episodes. Days. There's so much to cover with it, but we appreciate you having me. Thank today. you for having me. And thank you for watching us today on The Media Reporter. I've been Brian Dolan, and we hope you'll tune in again next week. Have a good day, New York.